I am Lawrence Rudnick. I'm a professor of astrophysics, part of the Minnesota Institute for Astrophysics. The thing that I'm interested in studying right now are called radio galaxies. Some galaxies have enormous black holes in, in, the, in their centers, what we call supermassive black holes, up to maybe about a billion times the mass of the sun. And from these black holes, enormous jets of plasma are shot out into space, and then we can observe them in the radio. So let me start you out with what we can see. So when we take a picture with a normal, what we call optical telescope, what you can see with your eyes, what we see are the stars in the galaxy, just like the stars in the Milky Way or other galaxies. When we take a picture with an X-ray telescope, which is again electromagnetic radiation, but in a very different part of the spectrum, very high frequency, very high energy, and we don't see the stars anymore, what we see is very hot gas around these galaxies, gas that's maybe tens or hundreds of million degrees Kelvin, much higher than temperatures that we get on the Earth, but they glow in the X-rays, and we take a picture in that part of the spectrum, and we can see the gas. And then at the other end of the spectrum, the low end of the spectrum, low frequencies, we see radio waves, and these radio waves are things that are generated by the supermassive black hole in the center of these galaxies. These supermassive black holes shoot out streams, jets of plasma that radiate at these low frequencies that we can pick up with a radio telescope. And what I'm interested in is how all these things interact with each other. How the jets that are coming out hit this X-ray thermal plasma that's millions and hundreds of millions of degrees, how they get distorted when they hit, how they get bent, and that's what a lot of my research involves. So the citizen scientists are critical to what I'm doing now. Here's the problem. We have a, an optical galaxy, you can see with an optical telescope, and in it is a hidden supermassive black hole. We have a radio picture where we can see jets of radio plasma that are radiating in the radio, and we want to measure how much they've been distorted, how much they've been bent, but in order to do that, we have to match them up with the optical galaxy that they came from. And that turns out to be a trickier problem than you might think, because there's often many galaxies around and it's not clear which one really has the supermassive black hole hidden in it. Computers solve some of the problem, but it really takes eyes on the human pattern recognition system to help us pick out which galaxy goes with which radio source. And that's what's happening with all the citizen scientists in Radio Galaxy Zoo, which is part of Zooniverse. Although we are in, in Radio Galaxy Zoo, we're sort of in the beginning of the process. We have had about 800,000 classifications at this point, 800,000 citizen scientists who have clicked to say this galaxy goes with this radio source. It enables you to see things that are very rare, something that only shows up one every few thousand times that we have completely missed before. We find things that have undergone very sharp bends in their radio emission. The jets come out from the nucleus and then they just go through a right angle bend, but they shouldn't. They should just keep flowing. There's nothing out there to bend them. And we found, our citizen scientists have found a number of examples of these. So we can barely keep up with what the sci citizen scientists are finding for us. We have two main paths that we're going down now. One is to identify all these exotic things that the citizen scientists are finding that we didn't even know about before and try to figure out what they are. And then the other one is just to make sure that we have the right connections between the radio sources and the optical galaxies. We need to do all kinds of testing to see how well do the citizen scientists all agree with each other, when do they disagree with experts on a comparison sample that we've put together. So we're very much in that early stage of trying to decide what can we trust, what can we conclude from looking at hundreds of thousands of classifications, and at the same time we're pursuing these exotic objects on the side. How long would it have taken us without the citizen scientists? It's just not practical. It wouldn't have happened. I mean, I haven't done the calculation, but um, it would take hundreds or thousands of years or something to do 
what the citizen scientists are now doing for us. And when you hit a number like that, you just don't do the project. So really, what's, it's the difference between being able to do projects and not being able to do projects.